lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your presence with us, Lord, and for the truths that we've been singing, restating. The truths that we can come into your presence, we can stand, because you have cleansed us. Because you've chosen us, you've, you delight in calling us and being with us. Because of your love, I live. And Lord, I want to live more and more in the life that you purpose for each one of us. Life, Lord. There is way more life than you are currently living. That he has stored up for you an abundance of life. That is more than you are currently living. Every one of us. I speak life over this fellowship this morning. Life. In the name of Jesus, the life that he came to bring life today. Hmm. Been talking about prayer for the last couple of weeks. Where it all starts with Jesus says that those who recognize their need of him, the kingdom of heaven will be given to them. Those who recognize their need of him. That's the essence of who we are. We've come to that revelation that actually life without Jesus, without our Father, without the Holy Spirit, isn't life at all. That's why we're here, isn't it? Because we found that. We acknowledge that he's the fountain of life. He's the source of all that we need, true life. There's loads of people living out there thinking they're living some kind of life, but it's not true life. He's the source of true life. Life how it was meant to be lived. So we recognise our need of him. That humility. Knowing that I can't do this on my own and I don't have to. He's here for us. He's here to help us. We're going to be looking at that in a, in a while. Last week we were talking about Jesus encouraging us to keep asking, not because somehow we might wear him down or he's waiting till you ask so many times before he gives you something, but to keep asking because then you do believe in who he is and you know that what you're asking for, if it is in his will, will be given. Will be given. But sometimes it takes a bit of persevering. Sometimes it, it takes a bit of continuing to ask, knowing that he's a good, good father. Give us today our daily bread, he teaches us. Even though he knows all our needs, he still says, ask for it. Ask for it. Ask for spiritual, what you need for your spiritual life even though he knows all that we need. So we're going to look at Romans 8 this morning. We're going to start at verse 18. This is what Paul says. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. 
that will include us. Against its will, everything on earth was subjected to God's curse. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, we also groan to be released from pain and suffering. There's probably a few nods there. <laughs> we too wait anxiously for that day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Yeah, absolutely. Now that we are saved... We are eagerly looking forward to this freedom. For if you already have something, you don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. That's what we were saying last week. Patiently, keep asking, persevering, and confidently in faith. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us, believers, in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, I said last week that Jesus encourages us to ask for the grace that we need but that actually what matters is what we're asking for and how we're asking. But Paul here in verse 26 says that actually you don't know what to pray for, nor how to pray. Oh. Oh. And actually, because we don't, that rather leads to frustration sometimes. In our prayer life, anybody been a bit frustrated in their prayer life? Come on, be honest. Yeah. Why aren't you doing this? I thought that was, I thought that was really your will. Why aren't you doing it? Perhaps even it can lead to a bit of disillusionment or exasperation. That's a good word. Ah, come on. Do your hopes so often get dashed or your expectations disappointed? You know, you really thought, I really, really thought that, that, that he was telling me to lay hands on his person and I was going to see healing and nothing happened. Ah! You tell us to heal the sick. Ah! Well, one of the answers to that is you might need to persevere. Sometimes all because you don't see things straight away. He does say, keep asking, keep asking. Or, there is a possibility you're asking for the wrong things. Even though it seems like the right things, you might be asking for the wrong things. Which is why our prayers, as I keep stating, need to be more about hearing what he has to say and what's on his heart more than what's on mine. Because even if I think what's on mine is really good and you really need to hear what's on my heart because it's really good and it's a great idea, God, it's better that I listen to what he has to say and his heart. So uh, Paul gives us a bit of the, the bad news, good news treatment, doesn't he? 
You know, do you want some bad news and some good news? Which one do you want first? Well, you get in the bad news first. We live in the already and not yet. Sorry, that's where you were born, that's where you live. We're in the already but not yet. We're in that period of the betrothal. If you remember that before Christmas, we talked about how you know, Jesus is preparing us as a bride and we're betrothed, but not yet. The marriage hasn't been consummated. And we experience, experience that inwardly in our struggles to understand things, in our struggles to live this Christian life the way we, we think it should. But we also experience it externally too. As we do, Paul says, with the whole of creation. The whole of creation's in that same state of tension. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God so loved the world he gave his only son. He came to redeem the world, put everything right. So, we're in a state where suffering and glory go hand in hand. The imperfect and the perfect coexist. We're in this age and we're reaching into the age to come. We're part of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. Because when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of heaven with him. He said, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. And the kingdom of heaven is advancing. But it's advancing, it's not yet taken over. We're in that tension. We have the reality of human frailty. Physically, my knees, you know. Spiritually, morally, we're frail. But we hold that up against the promise of the eternal, immortal, and incorruptible. Now, as Christians, it just gets worse here. As, t as Christians, the tension's increased. Because we know that the old, this world of where it's all gone wrong and you know, where there's pain and suffering, we know that it will eventually pass away. We know that the kingdom of heaven is advancing. And in time... The glory that's our future hope, it will be a present reality. And Paul says, actually, all of the stuff that you're having to experience now, it's just going to feel like, oh, was that it? Once we're in that future glory, that's our hope. And Paul explains, and I love this, that creation itself somehow recognises that. It is also longing for it. If you, you know, you even watch Winter Watch or Spring Watch or whatever, and it's horrible some of the time. You know, it's really tragic. You, 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 you know, you're rooting for all those chicks in the nest and you know that probably only one or two are actually going to make it, and it's horrible. Only the strong survive, etc., etc. Fallen creation creation that wasn't how it was meant to be is a result of coexisting with us, with mankind, who is not properly related to God. Because God made creation to be under the dominion of mankind in communion with God. And once we broke that communion the effectiveness of our dominion fell apart. 
And, and Paul says creation's actually waiting in eager expectation. You know, like, like a meerkat on the mound, looking out. It is, it's, that is the word picture, literally watching, waiting, watching out for a sign that its, its renewal is coming. I'd, I'd love to think that, that creation recognises something of that in us already. You know, when we, when we lived up in Cumbria, we lived surrounded by a farm. And um, when it was a nice sunny morning, I'd spend my mornings of prayer outside on a little bench we had. And the cows would come and watch. They'd all stand at the fence and watch. <laughs> now, I know, I know that it's because they're inquisitive, isn't it? But they did watch for a very long time, and I like to think that they sort of recognised something. They thought, oh, let's go and watch him do this for a while. <laughs> Paul shows us that our, our disillusionment and our exasperation and all of that, he explains that that is our groaning in here. And, and it's the same groaning that creation's got too. Oh, it's not supposed to be this way, and it is. Yet even us, even us who are no longer in Adam and we're in Christ, we're not exempt from that. Oh. I want to tell you this morning, and here's a bit of a, might be a relief to some, it's okay if you don't find this easy or straightforward. It's okay. It's okay. There's no easy answer. It's not like, there's not like some revelation that you haven't received yet that says, oh no, Christian life is just an easy sale. It's not. All right? And so it's okay. It's okay. This groaning is intensified in us. Why? Because occasionally, and more and more often, we have a taste of the glory that's to come. Why? Because Jesus has left us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit's here. We've been singing it this morning, we've been acknowledging it in prayer. Jesus left us his spirit to dwell amongst us. As the first fruits, Paul says, of what is to come. Playing, of course, on when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. It was the feast of first fruits. The first fruits of the harvest were celebrated. And so Paul says, Holy Spirit is your first fruits of the wonderful harvest that's to come, that will eventually come. But it's the first fruits. But when you have a taste of something, you want more when it's really good, don't you? You just want more and more. And so that's, that's why this, this groaning is intensified in us, because we've tasted it. Oh, I want, oh, I want to taste it again. So we've got this Christian dilemma. How do we live with what God, God has begun in us by giving us the Holy Spirit? And how do we live with that tension knowing that actually he will one day complete it in us when we enter into our full inheritance we're only getting sort of like a down payment so far. We, none of us, none of us can really imagine or grasp what our full inheritance will look like because we just aren't capable of ima imagining it. It will be wonderful. So the indwelling spirit gives us peace often, even in the, in the face of, you know, things where we shouldn't feel it, but we do, because it goes beyond our understanding, we, we get that, we get 
peace downloaded. Sometimes we have a joy in, in situations where people might look at us and say, why are you so happy? You know, but there's a joy that he deposits. And a taste of what will be. So that we continue to have this hope of the coming glory that will be ours. But the interim causes a suspense leading to a bit of pain and frustration. You know, I can remember a two-week trip to Malawi um, where we, myself and, and, and the guy that I went out to visit there who was running an iris base in Malawi, we, we must have prayed for hundreds of people and every single person was healed that we prayed for. And, it, and, it, and it, I'm not talking just about headaches, you know, and belly aches. I'm talking about some really amazing things. We got to the end of that two weeks and sort of did a, you know, an inventory of all that we'd done and realised every single person had been healed. Fly home, think, oh, this is just going to continue now, you know, with, with, with all the faith of that two weeks and everything else, so it's not down to that. And nothing, nothing. Now, you know, th lots of different theories as to why that might be, and, and, you know, part of those theories might be correct. But eventually you just have to hold it as mystery. It's just mystery. It's in the mystery of God and how things are. We're in this interim where we taste, and sometimes the tastes are big tastes. And we think, oh, we're there. We're in the glory. No, you're not, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. It's mystery. But in our exasperation and in our, ah, oh, why aren't you doing it here when you were doing it there? We must never doubt the goodness of God. And never doubt his word. Jesus says, keep asking, keep asking in faith that he is a good good father so Paul Paul says look it's absolutely ridiculous to place yourself in a position where you're going to claim no more weakness sickness pain decay or flesh life because Paul says get on with it you're in it you can't just claim you can't be in you know that river in Egypt you can't be in denial, denial there it is thank you thank you Steve Hebden Thank you, Steve Hebden. You're just in denial. If, if, if you're going to say, oh, no, no, Jesus has said, you know, got to heal the sick and all the rest of it, so there is no more sickness. Of course there is. And actually, if you start to deny that, it's, a, it's an absolute insult to those really godly men and women who I know who have, who have ministered wonderful truths and actually ministered healing in many people who are sick themselves. It's just an insult. It's merely presumption and arrogance to claim that because Paul says you've only got the first fruits. You've only just begun. But there's more. But there's more. And the kingdom is, is advancing. And so we expect more. We expect to see more, to taste more, to experience more. Yes, we're adopted. Yes, we're redeemed. But we've still got a way to go to enter into our full inheritance of those truths. But we do contend for them. Because the kingdom's advancing. And we know that we will see more. These first fruits don't run out. <laughs> They're increasing. Okay, good news now. The good news is that in all of this, in all of this mystery and confusion and battling with the tension of the already but not yet, the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress, says Paul. The Holy Spirit helps us. And again, the word picture there is like 
helping from the other end. So if, if you know, this was a really heavy table and I wanted somebody to help me to lift it, they wouldn't come and lift it the same side as me. Well, actually they might, but it wouldn't be a very good idea to, would it? The help is from the other end and we'd lift it easily. And, and, and that's the kind of picture that Paul wants us to, to grasp there. Helps us in our distress. Prayer is impossible without the Holy Spirit. All right? Feels like the most fundamental part of your, your relationship with God, but it's actually impossible without the Holy Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit Paul says earlier in the chapter, can we even cry, Abba, Father? Can we even say that you're my Father? It's only by the Holy Spirit that's deposited that in us. Prayer is access to the Father through the Son and by the Holy Spirit. So the inspiration of the Spirit in our prayers is just as important as the mediation of the Son. And we approach the Father only through Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. And only with the help of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that our weakness or our distress, depending on what translation you've got, is our ignorance. It's our ignorance. But, and this is the good news, the Holy Spirit knows what we don't know. He knows what we don't know. We don't know how to pray. He does. Thank God then that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. I mean, it's lovely that we intercede for each other. It's lovely that we pray for each other. And that's really encouraging when I hear that. You know, some of the prayers that people came up to me on Monday and prayed over me, and I'm sure other people felt the same at the renewal evening on Monday, were precious, precious, and so encouraging and comforting and life-giving. But I'm really glad the Holy Spirit's interceding for me. I'm really glad that he is also interceding for me. John Murray, in his commentary on Romans, says the children of God have two divine intercessors. Christ is their intercessor in the court of heaven, is pretty much what the letter of Hebrews is all about. And the Holy Spirit is their intercessor in the theatre of their own hearts. One's praying in heaven, interceding for us before the Father, constantly it says, always. Steve Hewitt is on his mind every moment of the day and is being mentioned before the Father. Isn't that wonderful? But not only that, the Holy Spirit in our own hearts is also interceding for us. And we know, because they're one and the same, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father, I know they're praying the same things. And what we need to do as we pray is come into agreement with what they're praying, isn't it? We need to just come into agreement with that. Do you think you can add anything? Do you think you can add anything to what they're already praying before the Father? I wouldn't have thought so. Nothing of value anyway. Paul says, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying with groans not without words, but literally wordless. Okay? 
not talking about tongues there. He's not talking about, oh, I don't know how to pray, I'll just slip into tongues. He's not talking about that. He's saying the, the Holy Spirit is praying wordlessly before the Father. Tongues isn't a gift just to fill the silence, you know. It's not a gift to fill, fill uncomfortable silences in our prayer meetings. <laughs> Tongues is something else. It's, it's when we run out of words to express what we, you know, we're longing to express in our heart. We know our heart wants to say something and there's not the language for it. That's tongues. It's not just to fill the silence. So why, why don't we know how to pray? Good grief, what a useless bunch we are, you know. Why don't we even know how to pray? Isaiah says in chapter 55, my thoughts are completely different from yours, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not omniscient. We don't know everything that there is to know. So, in that way, just as that disqualifies us from being able to judge anybody, because we're just not in possession of all the facts, in the same way, That's why we don't know how to pray. We're just not in possession of all that we need to know to be able to pray in the way that needs to be prayed. One way, just one way, that the Holy Spirit helps us in prayer is with prophetic gifting. There is a grace of the Holy Spirit that reveals what is on God's heart and on on his mind to us supernaturally. And it's the prophetic. And that gives us more idea of how to pray. And in fact, more often than not, you'll find that a prophetic picture or word that's given to you is actually to help you to pray not necessarily just to pass on. It's not, it's so often that prophetic picture is to give you more idea of what the Holy Spirit is praying. Especially when it comes to revealing something about somebody else. That discernment is not being given to you for you to criticize and judge. It's being given to you so that you know how to pray for them. So you know how to pray. But, Paul says in another letter in 1 Corinthians 13, for we know in part and we only prophesy in part. And he says a few verses later, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, or beautifully in the AV, through a glass darkly. So humility is required even there, isn't it? Even as you feel you're getting a download from the Lord about how to pray for somebody, remember it's only in part, and you only see things like, you know, through a, through a dark glass, not not with the clarity of HD or Super HD or Ultra HD. And so the value of corporate prayer, the value of coming together with others to pray. Because as a body, as a group, you're trying to get a sense of what God is saying and to pray according to what he's saying. 
The problem, of course, if there isn't lots of humility and submission to each other and a recognition that we only prophesy in part, it can lead to mayhem because one person says, oh, we should be praying this and the other one, we should be praying that and all the rest of it. There needs to be that loving submission and humility. But when there is, when there is, we're able to get a greater sense of how the Holy Spirit and Jesus are praying. So when Jesus says in Matthew 18, if two of you agree down here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together because they are mine, I am there among them. He's not talking about trying to find lots of people that agree with you so that you can gang up against God and and sort of like say... Right, right, uh, right. I've, I've, found, I've found five people that agree with what I'm asking, so now you better do it. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying that the power is not in the extra voices, it's in the extra ears. Yeah? That the more of you who are humbly submitted to the Lord when you come together and pray, the more likely it is you're going to hear what he's saying. And there'll be confirmation, because one person says, oh, I've got a sense of this, and just as they're saying that, another person over here will be saying, yeah, I was hearing the same thing. Pretty good confirmation that you're on the right track, which you wouldn't get if you were praying on your own. The value of coming together to pray with each other. So, you know, if Jesus is praying and the Holy Spirit's praying perfectly before the Father for me, where, where, where do I fit in? Where do I fit in at all? Where I fit in is verse 27, because Paul says, he searches our hearts, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. What a relief. God doesn't search our minds, he doesn't need to because he knows everything that's in there already. He doesn't need to find out what we know already. He knows it and understands it much better than I do. But he does search my heart, he's looking at my heart. He's looking at my heart as I pray. So those wordless prayers, because I find so often, actually, once, once you understand that the Holy Spirit is already in seeing Jesus is interceding, I am just more and more aware of my inability to pray. My inability to pray, as Paul says. You know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament there. <laughs> and he says, I don't know how to pray. You know, sometimes, especially when we have our Zoom prayer meetings, you know, we're praying for some massive issues. You know, be it in the Middle East, be it Ukraine, whatever. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? But he's searching my heart as I pray. Not my mind. He's not interested in what I've got to say about that. but he's searching my heart. And so actually, there is a value in saying in a prayer meeting, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray about, I don't know, what's happening in the Middle East right now, and not a single person has anything to say. <laughs> and that's okay. Because we're all, lift, we're all lifting up our heart that God would have his way. And yeah, and we pray that, don't we? We say, Lord, your kingdom come. We don't know the answer to this. But our hearts are for him to be sovereign in that situation. And that's what he's interested in. He's looking at us, saying, yeah, your heart is like mine. Your heart's like mine. That's my heart too. That's my heart too. 
Trouble is with Zoom is that if nobody says anything for very long, you think that the thing's gone down and you think, oh, is that my computer and all the rest of it. But it's okay for long silences. Right, don't feel you need to fill it with <laughs> Holy Spirit's already praying all that needs to be said. And so often, you know, in praying for someone, you just lift them before Jesus. You know, there's Jesus enthroned. And just picture yourself lifting them before Jesus, who knows all that they need. But my heart, Lord, is that you would touch them, you would have your way. And that is just as relevant of all the things that you've got to say about them and for them and everything else. It's your heart. How often I wonder if when you're physically praying for someone, would a hug be far more fruitful than all of the stuff that you've got to say over them with just an embrace you know he looks at our hearts that's why an inarticulate prayer doesn't matter it doesn't matter how, how you know how how well it all comes out it's okay it doesn't matter that's why the prayer of a child is often so effective because they're not bothered about how it comes out. They're just praying from here. Okay, so having said all of that, we don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer. Where I want to leave us this morning is that even though that's the case, what we say and do up and out of prayer does have power and does have authority. When we have approached him, when we've been in his presence, when we've sought his heart, when we've tried to listen for his voice, when he has given us something of that in prayer, what we do with that has power and authority. So, praying for somebody for healing. My heart, Lord, is for them to be healed. And perhaps he may give you a picture of either you praying for that person physically or, or, or the way he is, is dealing with them and he may sort of put his hands on a part of their body. For me, that gives me extra authority when I come out of that place of prayer to go to that person and do what I saw him doing. Yeah? Like with Phil. Prophetic declaration. If I get a if I get a such a strong sense, and especially in a corporate prayer meeting, we get a strong sense that God is is doing something, up and out of that prayer we prophetically declare it to whatever and whoever is listening. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. And we minister in the name of Jesus on the authority of what we've heard and taken out of that time of prayer where we've received something of what's on his heart. So, you know, Jesus tells his disciples, heal the sick. He didn't say, go on. Go and pray for the sick. He told them to heal the sick. Now, we obviously, we obviously need to go to him for what we need first. But once we receive an idea or a picture or a prophetic word of how he wants to heal the sick, we then minister that in the name of Jesus. Yeah? Still humbly appreciating that I only <laughs> see through a glass darkly and hey. Could, could be wrong, but this is the sense I get. And doing that then with the authority that has come from that place of prayer. Does that make sense? So even though we acknowledge we don't know how to pray, what we do up and out of it is really important, and that's our role as a body, as church, 
because when we're praying for out there, we'll get a sense of how he is praying for out there. As we, get a, as we pray for our town, we get a sense of his strategies and what he wants to do. And it's then what we do with that and the authority in which we do that because it comes from the place of prayer, which is really important. So yeah, we don't know how to pray. But prayer is our source of power and authority to extend the kingdom. In his name. There's one final thing. And that's the power to bless. The power to bless. You may not get a specific um, idea of, of what, what to say or how to minister, but you can bless from the heart of, of the one who you came close to in prayer. You get a sense of his heart. We get a sense of his heart from scripture, of course, too. Another way in which he speaks to us. The way, above all others. And we can bless each other with either scriptural truths or truths that we know are of the Father, of his heart. And we can bless each other. And that has power. It's, it's, it's another form of prayer, if you like, because it's prophetic declaration up and out of being with him. We can bless each other in the name of Jesus. The power to bless is so much greater than the enemy's power to curse. And I don't care how badly the enemy has cursed you have power in the name of Jesus not only to cancel that out but to renew, revive, restore and doubly return to them like Job. The power to bless is so much greater than the enemy's power to curse. The enemy is just another part of creation. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And if we speak over people a blessing in the name of Jesus that is from his throne, from his heart, that has power and it has authority to change. So, yeah, we can start with blessing each other in here. That would be a really good start, wouldn't it? <laughs> if we were a church that blessed each other constantly. But we can also start to bless out there. You know, even perhaps the things that go on that we think, ooh, that's a bit dodgy. Bless them in the name of Jesus. Bless them to receive the kingdom. Bless them to receive uh, um, an encounter with Jesus. Bless them to receive the truth that will cancel out the lies that they're believing in and that they're exalting in and all the rest of it. Bless them. Bless them with, with the things that the Lord wants to reveal to them and bring to them because he wants them to live. So even if it's just, I bless you with life in the name of Jesus, that has power and it has authority. And so what we're going to do this morning is as we pass the bread and the wine to each other, you are going to speak a blessing from the heart, from the throne of Jesus to the person that you're passing it to. Okay? So try and do that with a sense of what, what he wants to say to them, how it is that he wants to bless them. So, like, you know who you're sitting next to right now. So start to lift them before the Lord. Start to lift them up. Nick, it'd be a really good idea if you sat next to Steve in this. That'd be good. Because actually to bless our partners is a wonderful way to make life better, better and easier for yourself, you know. 
<laughs> it is, isn't it? It is. I bless you with all that Jesus wants to bring you, to give you. You know, he might want to say something specific to you. He might, he might just want you to speak life over them or love for. But bless them in the name of Jesus. So start to, start to kind of get, a, get one ear tuned in. If you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, you are welcome to take the bread and to drink the wine substitute with us. If you're not comfortable or you don't really can't really say that that's the case, just pass it on to the next person. But you can still say a blessing. You can still say, you know, you can still say, I bless you with a greater knowledge of Jesus. I bless you with the life that he wants to give you. I bless you even to find out more about who he is. Paul prays that, doesn't he? Over the Ephesian churches. I'm praying all the time, he says, that you would get to know his love more and 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 more. more. So that's where we're going to go with communion this morning. So you're just going to pass it to the next person and then obviously when it comes to the end of the row, pass it behind you. So just bless the next person. And now, you're going to have two blessings, aren't you? Because there's the bread and the wine. So as the bread comes by, a blessing. And then you can give a double blessing when you're passing the wine. Is that okay? remembering that all of these blessings are only possible because of what this represents. Only possible because Jesus is our mediator before the throne. We, can't, we, could, we couldn't pray if Jesus hadn't done this. We couldn't pray if Jesus hadn't died for us on the cross. We couldn't come to the throne we couldn't come to the Father with such ease, you know, such mercy, such grace, if Jesus hadn't died for us and made the way. We come to the Father only through Jesus, but by the Holy Spirit. So let's pray, shall we? Lord, as we remember what you've done for us, as re we remember that you have made the way for us to come before you, for us to be in your presence, as you have made a way for us to somehow join with you in all that you're doing and saying and extending your kingdom. Lord, we, we thank you that you have made this possible. But Lord, teach us, teach us to listen and teach us, Lord, the value and the power and the authority that we move in as we take what we've received in prayer and, and take it out into the world around about us. The power of blessing, the power of prophetic pronouncement, the power of pronouncing what you are doing over a place the power to pronounce good over evil, life over death and brokenness. So Lord, this morning, in your life, we speak life to each other. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, bring a powerful blessing here this morning. Come, Holy Spirit.